if you're Einstein and it's 1905 and you have, uh, you know, you have a pretty good idea, you submit it to a, a, a um, high prestige journal that goes through a peer review process where uh, qualified physicists look at it and it gets published. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty important. And if you're Einstein, and it's 1923, and your hypothesis is confirmed by an experiment, you make it onto the front page of the New York Times, as he did, in an article about this big, not continued on any other page. It's this big, says Einstein's theory confirmed by the eclipse, uh, by bending of the light um, visible during an eclipse. So you are sitting at home, you get your daily paper, 1923, you get the Times, there's the box, you say, wow, that's really, I'm really interested in this. I'd like to know more. Too bad you can't. That box is it. You had this much. If you wanted more, unless you were living in, a, in working in a philosophy, excuse me, in a physics department, physics lab, very unlikely you could find out anything more until some weeks later, maybe somebody will publish an article about it. And they probably won't. That's where we were. Peer review, academic journal that went to a few, a relative, relative hand, handful of, uh, of libraries and people, and maybe, rarely, occasionally, a, a, a very limited newspaper article. If it's 2011 and you work at the Large Hadron Collider and you come up with this data that suggests, oh, you know where I'm going with this, sir, <laughs> that <laughs> neutrinos go faster than light and thus Einstein actually was wrong, you don't do any of those things that Einstein did. Um, you're f uh, familiar with, this, uh, with, this, with these results, and I, I should mention, in case I forget later on, it turns out the data was wrong, were wrong. It was a loose optical cable that caused this, uh, this false data. Nevertheless, at the time, it was very it, conceivably the most important data of the century, literally since Einstein. It would overthrow Einstein. So they didn't go to a peer-reviewed journal. They went to a site called archive.org, A-R-X-I-V.org, which is a site that any scientist with any standing can publish anything on. You can publish your first draft, speculation, raw data that's been uncleaned up, final drafts that's waiting approval, and so forth. Uh, and you say what the level of, of uh, the quality of the information is. But, and when you go to archive. you know that's what it is. It's a site for people to post basically raw data. So this prestigious group of scientists with amazing data posts it without peer review at a s site where anybody can post anything. Absolutely the right thing to do because their interest was to get this information out as quickly as possible so it could be discussed. This is exactly what we want scientists to do. We want them to get especially controversial data out so that everybody can dis discuss it. And what happened? Everybody discussed it. Um, there's a really uh, good book called Reinventing Discovery by Michael Nielsen um, about uh, the networking of science, in fact. Um, he uses this example when he's when he gives talks. Um, so within a few months, 80 papers were published at archive.org about this, and obviously all around the web, all sorts of, of posts, discussions of every sort, from everybody, uh, from top scientists to uh, wonderful science journalists to high school students to complete idiots and morons who had the stupidest <laughs> ideas imaginable, people with other data, with hypotheses, everybody could publish and link to everything else. And so very quickly this web emerged of ideas and thoughts and hypotheses, um, some of which were great and some of them not worth anything. Uh, if you had, if, if you were looking for an explanation, no matter what level of expertise you were at, you could find it. If you didn't have the math, I don't have the math, you could still find explanations that were actually pretty good. And if you didn't, didn't understand those, you were not stuck in a little New York Times newspaper rectangle. You could get somebody else explaining. You had a question, you could pose it. And if you were a top scientist, obviously there were wonderful discussions going on as well. The ecosystem of knowledge is filled up. Every niche was filled. It seems to me that knowledge about this topic lived in that network. That that network was richer than the single article, the original article that was posted. And that that network was richer because of the differences and disagreements. If everybody was saying exactly the same thing, that network would have zero value. 
It's only because of the differences and the disagreements, the extensions, the elaborations, some of them going off the deep end, but some not. It's only because of all those differences that that network of knowledge had value, which means that knowledge no longer is only that about which we have driven out all disagreement. It is also that about which, and gains value from uh, containing difference. It's that about which we also disagree. Uh, many different perspectives um, that don't always sync up very well. <laughs>